All right, man, peace. So, brothers, this is going to be volume four in the What is Friendship series, and this entry will be featuring Mr. Kendrick Perkins, formerly of the Cleveland Cavaliers, the OKC Thunder, the Boston Celtics, etc., and Mr. Kevin Durant, the superstar forward, formerly of the Oklahoma City Thunder, and most likely formerly of the Golden State Warriors as well. And as I always tell you, brothers, when I start the entry to the series on What is Friendship, the scriptures tell us in Proverbs 17, 17, Proverbs 18, 24, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13. What are some of the dynamics? What are some of the components of real friendship? That a friend sticks closer than a brother, that a friend is born for adversity, that you must be ready to give your life for your friend. That's what a real friend is. And most of us will go through life, maybe if we're extremely fortunate, having one or two people of that caliber. The vast majority of people are never going to meet anyone that would fit those definitions or that criteria of what a real friend is. And that brings us to Mr. Kendrick Perkins. Because as I always tell you, brothers, if you want to understand what love is, all it is is loyalty and sacrifice. And those are the recipes for a real relationship with anyone, whether it be a friend, your significant other, your children, etc. When you love someone, you're ready to sacrifice yourself for them and you're going to be loyal to them through thick and through thin. You have to be some type of stabilizing factor for them. And Kendrick Perkins is pretty much going to lay out that he tried to do that for Kevin Durant. Now, we know that Kendrick Perkins is trying to immerse himself in the sports media world. He is a basketball pundit now. So he does have some dual allegiances. Is he saying that he told Kevin Durant not to play in the NBA Finals for some type of, of personal gain? In an attempt to show TV producers or fans or some of his colleagues at these networks that he works at or contributes to that he has relationships? Or is he just trying to convey that he told Kevin beforehand what he suspected was going to happen to him and how he was being pushed and prodded and prompted to participate in the NBA Finals when he wasn't ready? Because what a good friend will do is they will help you understand things about yourself that you're not willing to admit. I believe that Kendrick Perkins knows that Kevin Durant is, he's very insecure by nature. He needs to be validated by the outside world. And that makes him prone to manipulation. So anyway, they're going to talk about it and I'm going to chime in. This is Sports Center right now. I'm Antonieta Collins. Kevin Durant underwent surgery in New York yesterday for a ruptured Achilles suffered in Monday's Game 5 win against the Raptors. Yesterday, Warriors coach Steve Kirby had... Let me say this very quickly because this photo that Kevin Durant took, it really speaks volumes on what he's thinking. Brothers, let me say this very quickly pertaining to this photograph right here that Kevin Durant took in the aftermath of his injury in Game 6. I do believe that it is a projection of that warrior image that he wants his colleagues, his cohorts in the NBA to believe he exudes. That he's someone who was willing to fall on the sword. That he is a participant in and an adherent to the concept of the quote-unquote pseudo-samurai culture of professional sports. That I'm ready to risk it all. Look at me now. Please respect me. I know that you never respected me after I left OKC. Hopefully now you'll see that I'm one of you. You might not believe that I'm like a Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan or whoever who's willing to, to give my life for the game, but I am. Because there is an undercurrent in professional sports that the sport that you participate in is not just what, what pays you, it's also your religion. So there's no doubt in my mind, it's almost like a dude who wants to get down with a certain clique or a gang. And he goes above and beyond to show all the other members of the gang that he's tough. So he risks things that he should not normally risk, that no one else in the, in the gang is willing to risk, just to get respect. Teams thinking about why KD was on the court in a must-game win for Golden State. This last month was a cumulative, uh, collaborative uh, effort in his rehabilitation. Uh, and that collaboration included um, Kevin and, and um, his business partner, uh, Rich Kleiman. Who allegedly did not want Kevin Durant to play. So what are you really trying to say, Steve Kerr? Are you saying that Rich Kleiman was the deciding factor in Kevin Durant playing in Game 6? We know that's not the case. Let's be for real. You guys saw Kevin Durant as a doldger. You saw him as an errand boy, mentally. Physically, he's the leader of the gang. But mentally, he's the guy that you, that you send off to go run errands. And you know how insecure he is. You know how easy it is to guilt trip him. 
You know many of the insecurities that swim around in his mind, and you know how to play off those things. Kevin, we already know that you're leaving for the Knicks. Are you trying to sit out the NBA Finals and cost your current teammates a chance at a championship just so that you could preserve your body for the New York Knicks? Kevin Durant was thinking that in his own mind. Because that's what insecure people do. They overthink things. Because they're so worried about how they're going to be perceived when and if they do what's best for them. Kevin Durant blessed the Golden State Warriors with his presence for three years. If they were not able to win a third championship because he sat out, oh well. Oh well. That's how the cookie crumbles. They were able to win a championship in 2015, most likely because Kyrie and Kevin Love were hurt. They lost a championship in 2016, most likely because Steph Curry was not 100%. And there were a litany of other injuries that befell them in the last two or three games of the series. That's how the cookie crumbles. That's how Kevin Durant should have taken it. But he had to fall on his sword because of his own insecurity. And the Golden State Warriors front office, their mindset was, you know what? We know that he's leaving us. So we're going to make sure that there's not one drop of juice left in that orange before he leaves. That was their mentality. They didn't give a shit if he tore his Achilles. All this nonsense about it was a calf injury. That shit was never a calf injury. You could tell what he grabbed on the back of his leg after that first injury against the Rockets that that was not a calf injury. That was Achilles from the very start. Um, our medical staff um, is full of shit. His own um, outside um, opinion, second opinion doctor uh, outside of our organization. And um, Kevin checked all the boxes and, and uh, he was cleared to play by everybody involved. Um, That's interesting. Kevin Durant checked all the boxes, even though he never had a real practice with the team until a couple of days before the game that he played. And as Kendrick Perkins is going to tell us, all he had done before that was pool work. Pool work is what you do when, <laughs> when your leg is not even stable enough to do anything on a hardwood floor. Like, for example, way back in the day, and those of you brothers out there who are a little older, you remember, in the Michael Jordan video, Come Fly With Me, it documented how he, how he broke his foot in his second season. And part of his rehab was working out in a pool. But that's something that you do early on in your rehab. It takes a very long time of, of practice and rehabilitation on hardwood floors just for you to be able to, to even consider being greenlit for an actual game. So it's very obvious that the Golden State Warriors knew that they were drastically escalating his injury timetable. Now, would we go back and do it over again? Damn right. Um, but that's easy to say after the, uh, the results. Now, Steve Kerr worded that very awkwardly. He said, damn right, as if we do the same thing all over again. But it's very clear that what he meant was, if we could do it all over again differently, would we do it differently? Damn right we would. Because I think that he understands. And, of course, it's not going to surprise me at all if a week or so down the line, Kevin Durant changes his tune. Right now, he's been very conciliatory towards the Golden State Warriors and said, those are my brothers, that's my family, because he knew that he had to play the good soldier. But do not be surprised if by July 1st, July 2nd, he says, I'm not quite sure if I can ever trust this team again. I'm not quite sure if I could ever trust that medical staff again. So on and so forth. Because Steve Kerr and everyone else involved pretty much understands that when you preside over a ruptured Achilles, which is widely considered the worst injury that an athlete can endure, particularly in the NBA, <laughs> and you were the one who advised that athlete to come back and play when everyone and their mother knew that he was not ready. How was that athlete ever going to trust you again? Kevin Durant had this to say on Instagram. Basketball is my biggest love and I wanted to be out there that night because that's what I do. I wanted to help my teammates on our quest for the three-peat. And had he not gone down again, the Golden State Warriors would have become the second team to come back from down 3-1. Because they, they just would have had too much offense for the Toronto Raptors. The Toronto Raptors, they have a championship level squad against regular championship contending teams. Like say for example, had the Toronto Raptors existed back in the 2000s, and they would have been out there competing against the Spurs, the Miami Heat, the Detroit Pistons, Cleveland, et cetera, those teams of the, of the 2000s, you know, the LA Lakers in the front half and the back half of that decade, the Raptors would have won two or three championships with the squad they have right now. Because they have great length, they have great athleticism, they're great in transition. They're phenomenal defensively, so they have a championship caliber squad. But the Golden State Warriors, they're a historically great team. Offensively, 
when they're locked and loaded, they, they pretty much can blow teams out by 30 whenever they want. That's the way things go in this game, and I'm proud that I gave it all I physically could. I know my brothers can get this game six, and I will be cheering with Dub Nation while they do it. Now, let's get you back to first take. Big perk. What's up? Good to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. All right, Kendrick, I want to start with you. So you just heard Steve Kerr there. He said he wouldn't change a thing about how he handled the whole Kevin Durant situation. In terms, no, he did not say that. What Steve Kerr very awkwardly stated was that if he had a chance to do it over again differently, would he do it differently? That's what he said. All you had to do was listen to the entire soundbite. We can come back. What's your reaction to his comments? I totally disagree. Um, when you're dealing with a... Brother, this is an example of how the media takes something that someone says and due to poor listening comprehension creates a false narrative that never should have existed in the first place. The KD status, and I can understand if Golden State was going for their first title run, but they, they, they were talking about a 3 P. Um, just last week, KP was on, I mean, KD was only doing pool workouts. And then all of a sudden you have one practice day and then you come out here and then the next day you clear to play in the game. Because they were desperate. Remember, Joe Lacob has already let it be known that they're quote unquote light years ahead of everybody else. So they're not supposed to lose. This team was not supposed to lose the Golden State Warriors. Really, even without KD, they don't think that they were supposed to lose. But this notion that even without Kevin Durant, they were, they were pretty much a championship level squad against the Raptors, no. I think that, you know, it would have been interesting had Clay never gone down in game three and, of course, in game six, what would have happened. But I still think that Toronto probably would have won the series in seven. I might be wrong. Maybe Golden State would have won in seven. It would have been much more equal. But still, in the mind of Joe Lacob, they're not supposed to lose. They've invested way too much money to ever lose in the championship round or any round for that matter. So their hubris cost them everything. And that's pretty much the theme of Greek tragedies, that your hubris, your pride, your arrogance, it makes you make decisions that you're not supposed to make. Makes sense to me. And, you know, everybody keeps speculating and saying, oh, well, they released a statement that said in the Houston series that he hurt his calf. But usually when a player comes back from a calf strain, they have at least a protective sleeve over their calf or something to that nature. I think that it was something to do with his Achilles from the jump. Okay. That's obvious. That's my thing. And, and I believe that KD conspired with the Golden State medical staff to hide the true nature of his injury. Because they probably told him, look, you have an Achilles strain. If you stress it too much, it could pop. But if you give it about four weeks of rest, maybe you might be back by the finals, somewhere around that time period. And they probably stuck to that prognosis and the rest of his teammates may have known the true nature of his injury and said to themselves, Andre Iguodala's out here with a strained Achilles. How come you're not out here? Because remember, they claim that Andre Iguodala had a strained calf as well. I think he actually had an issue with his Achilles as well. You know, when you're dealing with a player, arguably the best player in the world in today's basketball, mm -hmm. you're supposed to take extreme measures. I'm talking about, you know, I had a source that I... Now look at Iguodala. On his lower left leg, he also has a wrap around the lower portion of his leg. And it's not really around his calf. It's around where his Achilles would be. Now, Andre Iguodala, and I'll probably be making a video about this in the near future. He also was on the Stephen A. Smith and Max Kellerman show. And he, and he pretty much stated, well, not on that show. I, I believe he said it on the jump. That he was told that there was a possibility that his Achilles possibly could rupture. Or his lower leg injury could become exacerbated. And he decided to just go for it because he said, I'm 35 years old. I've won three championships. If I blow up my Achilles, I just retire. It's not that big a deal. We had for us, Kaban Looney, and the, the uh, medical staff told him when he got first got hurt that he was he was out, he couldn't play. 
Kavon wanted to play. So his, what his agent did was t took him to three different doctors and got three different opinions other than outside the go to state medical staff, right? And all three of the doctors said, oh no, he's good to play. This is a common injury. This happens in football. It can't get any worse. With Kevin Durant, it could get any worse. Now look, look, this is bad for basketball, in my opinion. I think, you know, it's bad for the free agency coming up, all the teams that can clear the cap space. And KD is my brother, even more so than the basketball player. Um, we have a great relationship. We talk on a regular, and I told him, I said, hey, listen, KD, man, if you're not 60%, I mean, if you're not 85 to 100%, man, he never really told me what the injury was because I try not to dig deep into yeah. it. No, he never really told you what the injury was because he knows that you have a big mouth and you'll run on Fox Sports 1 or ESPN and divulge what he told you. That's why he ain't tell you. But my whole thing is, is that, you know, what, what did he have to prove? What did that's the question for him, bro. But when you're dealing with an insecure person, that's pretty much the question that they have to answer within themselves for their whole life. I'm sure that many of you brothers know, if you've been around beautiful women and one of them is insecure, she'll say the most absurd things about herself. And you'll look at her and you'll say, what is wrong with this person? She's drop dead gorgeous and she's asking you if you find her attractive or do you think that she's attractive? There are certain people like that who are cursed with the need for outside validation for their entire life. And that is a curse, especially if you're supremely talented because it makes it very easy for you to be manipulated. That's why you'll see drop dead gorgeous women out here being prostitutes or dudes like a Kevin Durant constantly trying to, you know, constantly trying to go back and forth with people who don't matter about his own life situation or his athletic career. It just makes no sense whatsoever, but that's how their brain works, unfortunately. To prove coming back. And yes, I do feel like he was, he was pressured. Of course he was. Iguodala admitted it in one of those interviews, either on first take or on the jump. He admitted that teammates were walking by asking Kevin Durant, you ready, right? Like he was pressured from, you know, his teammates. I feel like he was pressured from the coaching staff. i tell you one thing, if, you know, and I've been critical a little bit of the Oklahoma City Thunder on why KD left because, you know, everybody think he left because of Russell Westbrook. But and he did. That was one of the main reasons why he left. He got tired of playing with Russell Westbrook. In the case, he left because he wasn't able to beat Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. He wasn't able to be himself outside the court. But I tell you one thing. Well, here's the issue that I have with that, uh, Kendrick Perkins. He started a Nike campaign called Am I a Nice Guy? Something along those lines. I'm sure you brothers remember it about five years ago. During that 2014-2015 area that carried over into the 2015-2016 time period where he was being assessed with a lot of technical fouls and of course he had the commercial campaign through Nike about whether or not he was a quote-unquote nice guy or not and on the court he started to curse out the referees he started to get into a lot more back and forth with his opponents so I'm not buying that OKC quote-unquote never let him be him his problem was that he came onto the team and he established a, a personality archetype that was fake from the beginning he wanted people to feel like he was a quote-unquote good Negro, and he got tired of acting in that way, so he constricted himself. Russell Westbrook came onto the squad and, and was who he was from the beginning. That's why you're always supposed to be who you are. But now Russell Westbrook is a bigger fan favorite in OKC than Kevin Durant ever was, and he could still be the quote-unquote nice guy, be charitable, etc. Kevin Durant tried to play an act when he first got to the OKC Thunder, and he realized that he cast himself in the wrong way. He had no freedom to express himself how he feels like he wanted to express himself at different moments because he was constrained to, to being a quote-unquote nice guy. So, I'm sorry, brother, I'm not buying that one. I do believe that one of the main reasons why he left was that he felt like he could not express himself, but it was because of, of his own doings. And I also believe that equally, he was, he was tired of having to play alongside Russell Westbrook. OKC had one of the best medical staffs I've ever been around. And I didn't been around OKC when they told Kevin Durant when he had was dealing with a foot injury. No, you're not playing. It's just like, Max, you, you know, you watch box. Right, but when KD got the Jones fracture, that was not in the NBA Finals. That's, that was a totally different context for when the OKC medical staff put him on ice. 
you could tell if me and you going at it and Stephen A. Smith is in your corner and I'm banging you Hold up. On. Me and you going at it, Stephen A. is in the ring with me. No, no, out. I'm saying that Stephen, in, Stephen in, in your corner, he see me banging you up a little bit. But you're not bloody, you still lively, you feel like you could go, but you're not hitting me with nothing. And Stephen stopped the fight. He's stopping it for your best interest. He's protecting you. As a point. Do you think that Kevin Durant knew he shouldn't have played? And just and felt the pressure like he had to, but in his heart knew that he was too injured to play? Of course he did. It was pretty much like the same dynamic in the film Karate Kid with Daniel LaRusso. Remember, he trains to, to participate in the karate tournament at the end to stand up to the bullies. And then he gets his leg broke. And he says to Mr. Miyagi, this is not balance. For me to just be lying here, they still know that they broke me. And that's the same mentality that Kevin Durant had. His whole thing was, he had to show his naysayers that he was willing to throw his body on the funeral pyre if need be. Because he's looking for outside validation. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But as a competitor, you want to get out there. You know, but I have two twins at home. I have a pool that's outside. They're two years old. If I leave the door unlocked, they get them access to go to the pool. But if I lock the door, they can't go outside. They can't go outside and nothing drastic could happen. I mean, I just, I, I, man, I hated it. I made this point the other night. Eddie Fush told Joe Frazier going into the 15th round in Manila, yeah, I know you want to go on, I know the title's on the line, but you're not going to get killed out there, stop the fight. What? And Joe Frazier never forgave Eddie Fush for that. That was a blood feud, man. I might have to do a video about Ali and Joe Frazier one day because that was a blood feud in and out. People always talk about, oh, yeah, they made up. and uh, Let me tell you something. That was a blood feud. Joe Frazier allowed certain sentiments to subside as they got older. If they had to make appearances together at certain functions, he would put on a good little show. But Joe Frazier never, ever forgave Ali for the verbal torture that Ali put him through from about 1969 all the way through their careers. Never did. And he never forgave Eddie Fudge for stopping that fight. Joe Frazier was ready to die. He wanted to die. He would rather have died than have Ali defeat him again. And, so, and someone needed to be in KD's corner. It sounds like you were trying to be in his corner. Um, the idea that it was e that Steve Kerr said was a great coach. Love Steve Kerr. I love the fact that he takes social stands and he's uh, who yeah. Those are about the only stands that he takes. Social stands, meaning he does things for appearances, not for reality. When it's time for him to take a real stand for reality, he does not take that stand because if Steve Kerr was as caring of everyone and their situations as he acts as if he is, there's no way that he would have allowed Kevin Durant to play in Game Six. No way.